welcome back to the Ink Sync. I am Annie. I'm Kaylee. And you are listening to the publishing podcast for the rest of us. Whew. What a time. <laughs> um, I'm going to cut out everything that came before this, so please know that it took us several tries to do that today. <laughs> Somehow. We seem to have gotten worse. We're, we're We've so, just gotten worse. We're professionals. <laughs> we do this for play money. We did this for zero dollars. Yeah, there's I just no, want to be very no clear. Money. Annie, Annie gave me a Coke Zero. That's, I did. That's how I've been paid for my time. Your time, your <laughs> your beautiful soul, your oh. effort, your presence, your labor. I will happily share my pickled <laughs> radish with you later, Annie, if you would like some. I ordered sushi. Oh, I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this has gone off the rails, and we we did we literally just good i want to give you something to remember later awesome um (laughs) okay so kaylee annie (laughs) publishing news this week has been pretty bonkers we are going to get to what's going on in ukraine obviously there's not much that we can really give you guys on the ukrainian situation because we are just a publishing podcast but there's a lot going on right now unfortunately Yep. But before we jump into the news, I want to chat with you about some feedback that we got. I Yeah, you said that we had some interesting uh, feedback. So I actually got several people messaging me about the same story, and that is that Brandon Sanderson has launched a Kickstarter to fund and publish his next four books, or four books that he already wrote, and that's going to be going uh, out soon-ish, um, or he's going to start fulfilling and editing uh, soon. Um, I do want to say we are not going to be talking about that today. Even though it is newsworthy, uh, obviously he broke every record that Kickstarter has ever had, and that is incredible and good for him. But we will not be talking about it today. We will actually be talking about it next episode, because next episode we are going to be talking about book marketing in general, and we will be using Brandon Sanderson as our lead-in. Yeah, so I'd actually seen that before, and I think I had pretty much the same thought that you communicated to me with your eyes right now which is that people are weird and good for you Brandon Sanderson yeah good Godspeed. for him and now he's one of the best selling kickstarters of all time mm-hmm. that's good for him I'm mm-hmm. happy for him he seems to be someone who enjoys writing which I can only suggest that he continue to do it in a way that makes him happy yes absolutely uh the other f- piece of feedback I got back was about a question that we had about the difference between Dungeon Master and Game Master. So it's a trend that we've noticed that lately, streamers specifically, but a bunch of other groups have gone with Game Master instead of Dungeon Master. And so we wondered aloud and to each other if there was something specific that had happened that like caused this trend. And no one knows the answer. I had a couple people message me with theories, actually. One of them is that uh, when we were kids... Dungeons and Dragons was basically the only game in town for tabletop role playing and now there are more options and with those more options comes different language options and people, you know, getting used to a different way of speaking. Other people say it's regional and that on the west coast people are more likely to say GM and also that people on the West Coast, or if you're a streamer, you're more likely to be located on the West Coast. So that would have helped it spread more because they're streamers more publicly. I don't know which one. I, I My guess is it's probably some combination of like a million factors. Yeah. And it's just like, if you are if you are streaming Dungeons and Dragons, you probably play other role playing games too. And you just probably use them interchangeably. And I'm sure there's transition wise before like tabletop gaming and such like that was more widely accepted. It's a little bit easier to kind of low key talk about being a game master than low key talk about being a dungeon master. That's and, a good point. And also, <laughs> I didn't even think about that. You might stumble across the wrong Craigslist ad back <laughs> in the day. <laughs> We do have news. I found this really fun story from Book Riot about publishing predictions that never came true. Did you oh, get a chance I to did. Read I did get it. That was actually really good. I enjoyed that reading. I did too. What was which one was your favorite? That that real books would go away. Yeah. There's definitely always been technophiles that just hate technology and outside of that just Guys, it's just different. It's such a different experience. My favorite one was about the interactive ebooks. Oh, God. As if that's not already a video game. Like, 
<laughs> that's genuinely just a visual novel, guys. Like you could, like, I could, I have them. It's like the dra- just there are Dragon Quest visual novels that I could play on my PlayStation. It's right just now. a story heavy video game, like mm-hmm. Mass Effect. I mean, it's all just of the a Monkey good... Island games, it's yeah. point and click adventure. Yeah, that one was my favorite. Uh, you guys can check this out. It's on Book Riot, and we'll we'll put it into the show notes. Moving into real news, we promised you updates on Ukraine again. Everything's much less enthusiastic, like not much less silly from here on. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple sorry, good everybody. things. Like just to, just to be clear, but this is obviously a heavy topic. Just yeah. to be aware, we're not getting into the mm-hmm. specifics of events per se, but nothing is free, unfortunately, of the invasion. Yeah. And as a tease, we will be talking about manga, which is a little bit more of a lighthearted topic sure. as our main topic today. So if you want to just start fasting forward and, and fast forwarding, fasting forward, fast forwarding, fast forwarding, we, just know that th- this is not going to be dark forever, but we do have to talk about it. The BBC actually does have a tour based website. For those of you who don't know, Tor is a deep web internet browser that is not really something that you can access on Google. It's it's part of a part of a deep web that's just very different and slightly much slightly more inaccessible to the average person. And I did not know that news sites had deep web versions of their sites. Did you? I know. I was fascinated when I saw that because I mean it makes sense, but like it just it kind of put into perspective how seriously at least like one of the major news organizations that's you know still has, you know, some a, a decent readership trust base, like how seriously they take their concerns over censorship. Yeah, absolutely. So the BBC is encouraging Ukrainians. It posted instructions on its Twitter page for people to get to get to get access to its Ukrainian news. A lot of times we talk about making sure that social media companies and people reading the news are paying for the news, but sometimes I think that that obscures the fact that the news is essential in certain cases like this one. Oh, yeah. Ukraine, Absolutely. they need to know what's going on. They need to have access to the news. They need to have access to a free press. And unfortunately, right now, this is one of the very few ways that they're getting in. No, I think that um, it was it was a very interesting. I just hadn't thought about it. But what a what a good move. I mean, it's fascinating. And, and the deep web is not like the dark web, just to be clear. It is pretty much just less indexed, essentially, and to the point of zero indexing. It's difficult to do search searches on. So mm-hmm. basically, you kind of have to know what you're looking for. But it does mean that the measures that are being taken right now to, to block access in Russia and the Ukraine are not going to be effective. Just a language note. It is just Ukraine. The Ukraine, when people say that, that is a vestige of when Ukraine was part of the Soviet oh, Union. And the people of Ukraine prefer to just say Ukraine, Ukraine. because it is not... A region, it is a sovereign you nation. Moving on, we have an update from the News World. This is from Press Gazette, which is a British or- news organization uh, talking about how Canada is considering legislation to require Google and Meta formerly Facebook, to pay for the news that's featured on their platforms. This is something that was piloted and implemented in Australia, where essentially um, Google and Facebook were forced to go to the news organizations in Australia and work out deals for payment to actually feature the news on their sites. The justification of the Australian legislature was that if you're going to be making money off of the existence of our news on your sites, then you need to pay to support that news, which seems pretty reasonable to me. And now Canada is jumping into the game and And considering a similar legislation. Yeah, I think it just said that you need to support a free and fair uh, society for for news, which I to like super support. There are of course, you know, caveats in here and uh, a lot of observers are saying that the Australian law is not working technically the way that it was intended. The drafters of the law are saying it's working more or less the way we wanted it to. So they're they're kind of being like you're you're losing sight of the forest for the trees and I think that we're going to see some kind of deal because at the moment it's unsustainable where Google and Facebook are just posting up this news. They're not paying for it. The people getting the news aren't paying for it. But those reporters are doing the work. They gotta get fed somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can't just expect people to work for free. And news is, you know, news is a right. So uh, I know, I don't think that we're going to see like the collapse of the news industry or anything. There are a lot of people kind of making these doomsday scenarios. But I I do think that it would be really 
awesome and helpful if some of these platforms took a more proactive approach. Moving on, Kaylee, there is more news from the library army. Who is joining us today? Rise up, Connecticut. Connecticut. That's right. <laughs> Connecticut. Connecticut gonna get it. <laughs> Sorry, that was Kaylee, real bad. no. <laughs> I apologize. I'm just gonna, I have had zero alcohol today. I just want to be very clear. I'm just, just, this is, I'm just exhausted. I'm currently <laughs> trying to consume caffeine. This is a quote from Publishers Weekly. But from the Connecticut story, libraries regularly pay four to five times what consumers pay for the same ebooks and then are forced to rebuy the same titles every year, costing taxpayers thousands of dollars over the life of a single ebook and making a robust ebook collection out of reach for many libraries. Good on you, Connecticut. If we're going to get to 50 states, I believe in us. I agree. We aren't doing anything, but the libraries are moral support fighting back against these publishers. Uh, for anyone who's new to the Ink Sinker who, who uh, hasn't really been following this story, basically the the big 5 publishers in America represented by the uh, American Association of Publishers have been jacking up digital book prices, audiobooks and ebooks for libraries specifically, not for the customers. Because in their minds, library customers are worthless and they don't really care about them. They've said, like basically they're yeah. saying, basically they're saying if you're not going to pay us for our books, then you don't deserve you, our books. You don't, you don't deserve, deserve to, to read to read them, which is just fundamentally against how libraries are supposed to work. So basically... Do you know what means? You know what, you, you know what gets you access to people who like your books? Is letting them try your books. Letting them read your books. You know what gets you pirated? Not letting people... Read your books. Read your books. Yeah. People don't want to steal things. Like, I don't know if you do this, but if I'm looking for a movie, I will literally shuffle through three or four apps to try and find one where I am legally allowed to watch it. I will do Absolutely. my best to n I want to pay for it. I I'd want like to, to consume it legally. Yep. And if you are going to block me from that, that I is will... when crime happens. Yep. We don't we don't condone piracy, but we I, don't, I, but no. like but demonstrably this is how it happens. Yeah. Demonstrably. Like this is specifically like when they went live with more streaming services, piracy went down. Exactly. Yeah. Go figure. 100%. <laughs> How weird. It's it's crazy. So Connecticut is the latest state. I don't believe we are in the double digits yet, but we are over the over 5. Like we're 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 on on the upswing. The momentum is there. Because public libraries are public services, they can actually go to their state legislatures and lobby for the legislatures to legislate and force the publishers to give them more fair rates. So that's what's happening. It started with New York and Maryland. The Maryland law is currently in limbo, but they're hoping to defend it in court. It was blocked from being implemented pre-trial. So we're still kind of waiting to hear about that. The New York one, the publishers lobbied the mayor hmm. or the governor. governor and yeah. uh, so that one was vetoed, but it's likely to be reintroduced in the next legislative session. And mm. now we have several more states stepping up and introducing more legislation. We, Kaylee and I, are obviously extremely biased. We <laughs> believe Make that no libraries are essential to life and i don't think that that's an exaggeration so. no and i think that the people fighting this law instead of trying to work with the states to establish equitable terms they're actual cartoonish villains they are it's ridiculous so around the beginning of the year uh, a lot of businesses kind of do their business reviews and decide what they're going to do for the rest of the year which is why we've been getting so many updates from these corporate news companies adding more journalism desks so uh in that vein axios added uh, local journalism nest, which was very interesting to me. I was not prepared for that. The, the spread of information in the Axios articles was fascinating because that was the most interesting part of, the, of that one article that was talking about bullets, bullet points. Yeah, so... Ax and it was like in the middle, it was like, this is really cool stuff about what Axios is doing. And then on either side, it was like... Axios bullet 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 weird formatting and then uh, cool thing and then that's Axios <laughs> what yeah it was I hated it so Axios has made a name for itself recently as a millennial and younger focused newsletter company where they don't write long prose articles they write bullet points and that's been very popular for people who are you know trying to consume their news but don't want to sit down and read all the nuance, all the details. They want the bullet points. So Axios has been growing like gangbusters. 
And now they are branching into local news, which I would have thought is... I don't understand why this is such a breakthrough, but apparently, like, I knew about this, like, 20 years ago. Like, this is good for them to do this. Holy shit. So we have different views then. My thought was that that's antithetical to what they're doing because local news is almost all about details. It's almost all about the local color. Well, any any particular article is going to have to have the details and the specifics that they're pinning their whatever their narrative around. And I don't want to say narrative as in a fiction, but like the the structure of their argument or, or communications. I guess I was responding to a different part of the article. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. No, because um, they're in a world where they're responding to the fact that like a lot of people have lost faith in journalism mm-hmm. and they're 100% looking at market research and saying like, well, where do people engage more? Where do they find that they trust it more? And it's a place that you can verify. Well, your local news is something that you can verify. Mm-hmm. It's something you have a lot more faith in and trust in and that you can actually just go and be like, hey, was this, did this accident happen? Or did this store get robbed? Or, you know, was there really like a fun event at this one place or whatever? And I mean, are there actual issues? Was there a local protest? Uh, like all of that is something that you can actually start to engage in. And then they build up their readership. They build up their faith, their brand. And then they can start branching back out into the larger structures. Now that you're saying it, that makes absolute sense. I was just thinking from like a a structural standpoint of the way that Axio structures its stories, mm-hmm. which seem very light on detail, but local dirt. Maybe, maybe you're, I mean, you're, you're obviously correct. And I hope, I, I think that we're really going to see a new take on local news it, and then because I think that there's, that's the only way that we can rebuild trust. Uh, we talked about this last time about how a bunch of the new news desks coming through, like from the Washington Post, adding a bunch of health and lifestyle coverage because that's where a lot of engagement is happening. And so this and is like people haven't thing. totally abandoned that readership hasn't totally abandoned mm-hmm. like major companies yet. We actually also have more news, news on news, news, news. <laughs> we have more news, news about uh, funding for these companies, these news companies that are trying to do something new. So Kaylee, we work in finance, not not everybody does. Can you really quickly in just a couple sentences explain what VC money is? Oh, venture capitalists. Um, grow fast, grow big. It's not good. <laughs> You said real fast. I did it. You did it. You did it. Three points or less. Uh, that's, that's that's venture capitalism, basically. Uh, venture capitalists, they, they spend money to make a company grow fast and mm-hmm. then cash out. And that's basically it. So that, that what they do becomes very important because if a VC makes a good bet, then that company is going to make a lot of money. And crucially, very interestingly, VC money has been getting much more cautious in news innovation, which I thought was a fascinating point. Uh, This comes to us from the Press Gazette, which is a a UK news organization. I don't know if you've, some of us have been paying more attention than others to the stock market during the pandemic, but uh, BuzzFeed recently had an IPO and did horribly. Like after the initial bump from like, the 2010s essentially right the original buzzfeed Mm -hmm. investments and it's now people kind of just saying "Mm, nope which is i thought very interesting because i would think that with announcements like this one from axios who are jumping into not just a new market but thinking hey here is how we can help journalism as a whole i would think that vcs would want to get into that but apparently we were wrong there the money is getting much much more cautious they are avoiding innovative news organizations altogether. I have to wonder if this particular plan works out for Axios, it's awesome, but I wonder if the issue isn't that news is one of the few, especially for news companies, but news in general is one of the few industries that needs a sustainable, scalable approach because it has to be ethical and Mm. trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So the transparency has to be there from the start and has to be very stable as far as it goes. Like there are certain industries that will not only just respond well, but won't be injured by the growth of a venture capitalist's investment. But I mean, like, look where we're at right now. And they don't have to grow ethically. Like Facebook didn't have to be ethical in its growth. Yeah. No. You're right. And before we finish out our news section, I wanted to quickly talk about the Tolkien side. The Tolkien estate is ramping up its uh, social media and outreach efforts in anticipation of the new Amazon series. So they updated their website with... New art. New art. It was really cool. I did like the art. That Beautiful was stuff. Very nice stuff. So you can go now to the new Tolkien estate website and see some previously unreleased art. However, there was some also some updates to some strong language. So yes, but but nothing new. This isn't new. <laughs> no. This has been uh, so the Tolkien estate is very protective of its IP. 
even more so perhaps than the Doyle estate, as you haven't seen like movies make its way, make their way to Netflix before the, the lawsuits happen, right? So that said, like a lot of the stuff that they're talking about, they're not going to go after like your local mom and pop Tolkien book club or whatever, but they did restructure and kind of update their terms and conditions essentially, and that they, they're making it very clear that they are protecting their investment essentially so that way they can you know have that precedent if they need to take anyone to court yeah i i really i recently wrote a paper about the legality of fan fiction and the tolkien estate does have a leg to stand on here but i mean most fan fiction is just this sounds horrible but most fan fiction is not going to affect the market of tolkien's ip unless your fanfic is like the best fanfic to have ever been written in which case more power to you but you will get sued do your best to file off the serial numbers if you're going to try and sell something. But uh, yeah, so the Tolkien well, estate doesn't have a ton of legal standing here to to go after fanfic mm-hmm. writers, especially when we're talking like two, three chapters, mm-hmm. you know, 150 words or whatever. So uh, I but- don't think your, your L. Ron coffee shop <laughs> self-insert reader OCAU is going to... I don't think you're going to have a problem. Wow, I'm feeling attacked. <laughs> and he's like, how did you know? Have Jesus. you been looking at my hard drive? <laughs> But basically, so that this this turned into a little bit of a kerfuffle on some fanfic sites and on Reddit. People saying, "Does this mean we're not allowed to write fanfic anymore?" And some other, I I don't know this for sure, but my guess is that the ones chiming in and saying it's fine, just trying to random olds, yeah, the olds <laughs> kind of coming right in there, saying yeah, like, "No, guys, it's gonna be fine." It I lived works. through the Anne Rice Wars. Oh this is nothing. <laughs> That's right. Was it um, Anne McCaffrey and the Anns? Anne McCaffrey, Anne Rice. Back in the wild, wild west when people didn't understand what fair use was and how how it actually applied, like people would just get like harassed, genuinely stalked by these people's lawyers. And we all learned. And so we were passing on our our information to you, the youths. Learn from us. Learn from our our misfortunes. We should do a deep dive on the legality because it has gone to court several times. We should, absolutely. All right, moving on to our favorite news section, women and minorities killing it in publishing. Kaylee, you don't listen to the Daily Podcast, do you, from the New York Times? You know, it's funny. I signed up for the New York Times, but no, I just read their stuff. The Their podcast is so good. I think it's number one or number two uh, news podcasts overall. Mm-hmm on any platform. They are so amazing. They're, they have been hosted exclusively by a man named Michael, Michael Barbaro. Um, they, it only launched a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. And the throughout that time, to it. you should. Well, it's free. It's a podcast. Yeah, you yeah. can get it on any podcast app. Any podcast app. You can get the ink thing. You can get the thing. <laughs> Throughout that time, though, they've been doing, you know, they, they do really interesting deep dives. And one of the reporters that has been featured on it frequently is someone named Sabrina Tavernisi. And she is now joining as a co-host permanently. Good for her. What a great a badass, by the way. She's amazing. Like, she Her series on Baltimore oh was incredible. Yeah? She did a series on, on Baltimore, the crime and police in Baltimore. And I, it was so good. And also... This is this sounds really weird and shallow, but since it's podcasting, it makes sense. Her voice is beautiful. I yes. love her beautiful. Oh, she has like a so beautiful, good. deep, calm voice. I love it. Keep on keeping on, Sabrina. You did awesome. Good for you. And I yeah, like the whole article it was just like this little like somebody was just fan fan personing so hard. Yeah. I enjoyed it yeah, this, so much. This article was from the New York Times and one of Sabrina Tavernese's colleagues was like, Yeah, yeah, Sabrina. It was awesome. <laughs> like they were just talking about like all the cool stuff that she's done and I as somebody that hasn't been as with it on like the podcasting side of things. Holy crap, like she's doing great. She's really cool. She's an amazing lady. Do you wanna do the next one for us? Yeah. All right. So Axios named Jamie Stockwell. There we go. The executive <laughs> editor. I'm sorry. I tried to say that like three times in my head and it came out like as a jumble. <laughs> so um, Axios named Jamie Stockwell as their executive editor for Axios Local, which is the other portion of the the interesting piece of news from yeah. the middle of that other article <laughs> that I was that I was talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that's so cool. Like, so she's um, Good for her. she's absolutely she's a, apparently been a, a longtime editor with her their team and i can only support her like yeah heck yeah girl get it yeah especially since the whole point is that they want to 
encourage trust and engagement in news. Like, yeah, I think that's awesome. And you need a very strong editing team. And then again, their plan is to build up ground up. And that's the best way to do it locally. You start building up your brand and the trust in your from your readership again. Like, yeah. and that's where you want to put your good te- your good talent. Keep on sparkling, ladies. We will continue to bring you victories from minorities and women in publishing. If you listeners have any oh, minorities yes, and women in publishing in publishing that you want us to shout out, go ahead and send them to us. We will take a look. Now for our favorite section. Kaylee, what are you reading? I'm nothing new. I'm nothing absolutely new. terrible. But I did read some interesting like blurbs for things that I've added <laughs> to my to read list from our main topic. What what interesting blurbs have you been reading, Kaylee? So apparently 2021's most popular best selling novel is called Dick Fight Island. <laughs> And I had never heard of it until I was starting to research things for our main topic today. Wait, wait, wait. Best-selling novel? Like... That's what it... That was the headline on CBR. Oh, my God. 2021's, like, <laughs> best-selling novel. Or boys love... Like, Dick manga Fight is, Island. Is somehow, a, like, a boy... I don't remember well, exactly, but... Well, tell us about so Dick Fight Island, Kaylee. I want to know. <laughs> so, apparently... Apparently, it's like you gladiator-style try to get your opponent off and if you get off first you lose and it's all dudes of course because it's dick fight island uh well maybe not of people course. with penises maybe not of course P- apologies uh that is a very good point it is a people with penises <laughs> apparently the main protagonist has been on a training mission for four years just having a time learning the techniques of other countries and he's back they're back i don't actually know i haven't read anything but it's on my list now because of the absurdity of this article that i backed into i did not i was not expecting to get this information but yeah i'm trying not to interrupt my laughing Sorry. It's okay. Please do because like I was like you guys are choking over here with this. It was really funny. My my boyfriend walked in as I'm like staring at my laptop like what now? Oh, what did he did he see? What he like is that a penis with armor on it? He's like I have to go read the blurb about this right now, and then he read more and helped me get more information. So it was very appreciated. Can I tell you? I had almost the exact same experience. <laughs> so my husband came in and was like, babe, do you want to see this book that my friend who works at Barnes and Noble just got in and just showed me the picture <laughs> of the cover. And I was like, is that a penis armor? Is that a penis armor? And he's like, yeah, wait. And then read me the description. And I was just like, what? <laughs> what is going on? Um, well, I've actually been doing research for this show. So I have been reading this book called Manga, an Anthology of Global and Cultural Perspectives, edited by Tony Johnson Woods, who is an extremely thoughtful editor. And their introduction to this book is very, very nuanced and fascinating. So we are, uh, I think I mentioned this at the top of the show, we're going to be talking about manga and the rise of manga in the US here in a little bit. And I have been really, really interested. So it's, 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 it parallels pretty closely the rise of comic books in general obviously in a different country with different a different culture and different you know cultural norms it's just a different society and i have been absolutely fascinated on that note we are going to take a quick break and we'll be right back to talk about the rise of manga in the u.s and why you're hearing so much about it lately stay tuned Welcome back to the show. We are here talking about manga and its rise in the U.S. It is really lucky that you brought up Dick it's Fight Island. Oddly timely, one might say. I can't say it without laughing just because it's such, <laughs> such a ridiculous a... name. It's they I, fight with their dicks. I had the same thought. I don't know if you have. I don't know if you watch like horrible reality TV on Netflix, but I got the ad for Fuckboy Island and I had to giggle every time I saw it. I don't know why. It's just like the rhythm of the name. Oh, this, yeah. The, the sheer ridiculousness of there being an island. Um, I, so, I definitely feel that vibe for sure. But it is a manga, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, 100%. And apparently a very well-received one. <laughs> so five out of five on Barnes and Noble. On Barnes and Noble, that's right. And, and 93% on Google. Like... <laughs> of people liked this book. Like, it's amazing. I can't stress enough. I absolutely am delighted by this development, and I hope that it can... Actually, it will continue. Kaylee, you you knew this stat, but I want to tell you guys, listeners, in 2021, sales of manga in the UK were up an 
eye popping 157 percent to 20 million pounds. Uh, now that's a stat from the UK, but I can't imagine that it's too different in the US. That actually, that 20 million pounds is about half of the entire graphic novel market in the UK. The entire graphic novel market was up to about 40 million pounds in 2021. And that encompassed uh, general graphic novels, superhero graphic novels, nonfiction and literary graphic novels, and manga. And manga was half of those oh, sales. Yeah, just dominated. Absolutely insane. I mean, and we don't, I don't want to discount because all of those other segments also had double digit growth. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, every, every, every segment, like last year, like growth in general. And that was over 2016. So that's not just like a, a function of the pandemic that is just several years of comics being doing awesome and mangas are comics so if you i don't know don't know what manga is it's comics that are exclusively or maybe not exclusively but at least tangentially produced by and in japan it is a specific art and story style Unfortunately, it's very difficult to define <laughs> manga outside of uh, just saying you know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. And I, I mentioned in our what you're what we're reading section, this book that I'm reading, they also didn't have a definition for it, or the definitions that they had were just talking about some specific types of uh, a style of panels, the way that the panels are situated, and how the borders are kind of broken pretty constantly, and how. American graphic novels don't do that. But again, it, it, it was a little bit old. I, I told this to Kaylee. The scholarship on manga is very old. It seems to have just... Spotty, yeah. It seems to have just stopped in the US around 2010. So a lot of my numbers outside of the, the business numbers that I just gave are kind of old, which and is really annoying. That, yeah, it seems that the people were just looking at growth as just a general matter of analysis that's been happening since the pandemic. They're like, well, what can we look at? Like, how, how mm -hmm. are we doing? Like, what can we judge this by? Yeah. And just straight up of figures and sales is kind of what they came up with for a lot of things. Yeah, but we wanted to talk about how manga came to the U.S. and its rise in the U.S. Now, there are a lot of theories about this. I found this lovely paper by Casey Brienza in Publishing Research Quarterly. And again, this is from 2009. So a lot of these, a lot of these numbers are, are, are out of date, but uh, we can assume that they're at least relatively similar. 2009 wasn't that long ago, but it, it was a fair amount of time ago. Manga is provably avidly consumed, consumed by all segments of Japanese society. And in 1996, it, this paper cites the height of its popularity. And it, at that time, it represented nearly 40% of all books and magazines sold in Japan. So this is a hugely popular market, or a hugely popular product. And it didn't really take off in the US until the beginning of the 21st century. We There are tons of, you know, theories about how and why manga came over, you know, the GIs coming back from World War II, uh, a lot of repressive attitudes in Japan, forcing bootleg copies over into the US. No one really knows for sure. Obviously, all we can really point to are business records. But uh, we do know that manga sales grew 350% from 2002 to 2007. So we know that when it when it got here and started to get big, it got big. Yeah, it was like slow. And then it just continued. It's like a snowball rolling down a hill for sure. And of course, we have tons of quotes from uh, people working in, look, working in the book selling business at that time being like, we've never seen any any kind of growth like this. And so that's kind of explains why your local bookstore has a manga section, most yes. likely. And it's probably larger than the comic section. Which is so much. That Though I will say the trade paperback, the comic section are growing. That is actually an excellent point. If yeah. you combine the two, and to be fair, manga is just manga. If you combined the two, they're probably going to be about the same or slightly larger in the trade paperbacks. I think that if the... you combine manga and graphic novels, trade paperbacks together, they would probably be larger than the sci-fi fantasy section, yes. which is where they usually 100%. are relegated if, if the whoever's organizing the bookstore doesn't quite know what to do with them. That is accurate. It's very funny. Every now and then I'll go into like a Barnes and Noble that hasn't been updated in a while and you, like you can't find the graphic novels anywhere. It's because there's no sign. They're just like one shelf in the sci-fi fantasy section. And no, even though like half of those graphic novels are not sci-fi or not fantasy. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> so there are probably about 10, again, as of 2009, major manga publishers in the US and the, the main one is Viz Media. It is actually co-owned or it was as of 2009 co-owned by two Japanese companies and it is also referenced in this um, bookseller article because the vast majority of that that growth in the UK market in 2021 what was it 23 of the top manga titles 
in 2021 were from Viz Media. And you'd heard of Viz Media before. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. So um, Viz Media, they're, they were one of the early adopters. So the company, I can't remember their original name, Mix, I think, which has now become Tokyo Pop, was one of the others. And so they were one of the, and when I say one of the early ones, I don't mean like Astro Boy era. <laughs> Which which is an interesting thing that Annie might have more details on, but I can just say that um, early, outside of one specific like title that was per- basically crowdfunded in like the 60s, when anime first came over, when manga first came over, they basically rewrote it from the ground up. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. so like Astro Boy uh, was definitely like one of those titles. People didn't know it was Japanese. They essentially yeah. genuinely just built it from the ground up again. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did that with... A lot of the early titles, and that might be part of the reason that it felt a little more samey and didn't maybe take off as much. I don't mm-hmm. know, but, you know, as as it went, you know, that happened a little less. So, but yeah, so Viz was one of the ones that initially, like, they took the risk and started adding manga into, like, Borders. Back in, back in the day when Borders was a bookstore. Oh, R.I.P. Borders. I know. I miss that. I miss Walden Books, too. But yeah, so they took a, bit, a pretty big risk, and like it just shot. I think that was probably one of the... Because you, you exposed like when you had a kid, it was with their mom, in the sci-fi fantasy section. And they're looking at the manga, and it just started going from there, probably. Um, exposing people to it like that, and it snowballed so fast. It really did. So what Kaylee's talking about in the 1980s, uh, when Astro Boy and Lone Wolf and Cub were first coming out, most of the people, as as we were saying, a lot of these get mislabeled, misshelved mm-hmm. into like the sci-fi fantasy because people aren't quite sure what to what to do with them. And even among manga fans, they'll or um, among Japanese people, they'll see a lot of manga as just you know something that's for little girls or little boys. At s- similar to how people kind of see the comic book industry today is like it's just for kids and it's not really that serious or it doesn't have anything super. Yeah, what do I want to say? Risque. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> just saying guys and then you give them what dick fight island and then and there's then this <laughs> and then they're like wait a second wait a minute this is for children so around the 80s actually the one of the reasons that viz felt comfortable enough to take that risk and to to make that change was because in the 80s it was the rise of more cheaply produced comic books so this paper Which from constant Casey Brianza talks about the the success of the 1984 self-published Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which I had not heard of before, but apparently is this like seminal thing where when that took off, there was a full bubble of small pl- small press black and white comics. And so these these companies kind of saying, hey, well, there's already this some IP. It's kind of expensive because we do have to do the translations and redo all the images and stuff, but it is cheap to produce because it's just in black and white. We don't need it to be in color. Up until this point, a lot of comic books were in color and realizing that customers will buy it even when it's in black and white. And to this day, a lot of manga is in black and white Mm -hmm. because it's just much more cheap to produce. I mean, and to be fair, like, it's kind of uh, looking at it as a general, like, industry. You're always going to have the passion projects and that are people are just devoted to and to make the art Mm -hmm. as gorgeous as possible yeah and not that there's anything genuinely wrong with going towards something that's a little cheaper a little you know like just more accessible yeah the story itself can still be good and and fantastic storytelling and art and like the the lines etc it's just a different way of approaching the base art i think that it was that was probably economically one of the reasons that it did so well initially is because it was much cheaper Mm-hmm. Much cheaper to produce in the 80s. Yeah, the recession in the 80s, probably. This paper does go on to talk about how, at first, Viz and the other companies tried to replicate comics publishing in the comics publishing format, um, publishing things in floppies, the the issues, once a month. But then realizing this stat made me laugh a little bit. If they had tried to do that for some of these specifically for Dragon Ball, it would have taken over 20 years to bring it out to market it's in, in its entirety, just releasing a couple pages at a time. So they were like, F that. <laughs> they just started re- releasing things in, in the actual... In actual format. What we which... would call trade trade books today. <laughs> I have to agree. What? No. 
I know. Thank God they figured it out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we can talk a little bit about uh, how it got jumping into bookstores. So basically, uh, Viz was able to convince some bookstore managers to have entire uh, manga sections. Mm -hmm. And that really fueled it because, you know, people were like, what is this? And then you kind of sit there and, and, and stand there and read the stuff. By the way, can I give you probably my favorite factoid? Yes. Of this whole thing? I please, I would love you. People crowded around the shelves reading the book instead of buying them there's a word for it it is called tachi yomi and it means standing reading and i thought that was the most charming thing i had Aww, ever heard that's a, that is great i love it and tony johnson woods who edited that book that i referenced earlier said you would think that this would be frowned upon but it's not just a quick visit to any manga section of any bookstore will show it. It's just like being a library patron. Like, it's Mm going to encourage people eventually to go to to buy something. They're going to read enough that they're going to want to own it. Yeah. Or they're going to put it down and pick something else up that they could get more into. And, I mean, nothing draws a crowd like a crowd. You're a lot likelier to go into a restaurant that has at least a few tables full than to be totally empty. Oh, that's true. I never even thought about that. But yeah, absolutely. Do you want to talk a little bit about the sexism here? Because it's going to be difficult for us to go much further without it. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. (laughs) I just got really sad. Just always. So as we had talked about earlier, you've got a perception around uh, manga, anime in general, but specifically a lot of the manga perception is that it's for kids or it's for girls. Japan even has certain words for it when you're a super fan, where it's like you're being mildly problematic about, not even mildly problematic about it. And you've got that here. And then there's a variety of ways to be sexist about how people engage with, with manga and with anime in general as well. So specifically, I'm going to be just generally more comfortable speaking to the fact that Western culture just over-sexualizes Japanese people massively. And it's it's specifically, it's going to be hitting ladies the hardest. 100%. There are statistics. I'm not going to quote them. You know what they are. (laughs) Feel free to look them up, but... It's, it's, it is an issue. It's a problem. I mean, it starts from the earliest bits. I had some of the first manga ever released in the U.S. was a tie-in to the Sailor Moon TV show. And when you start out appealing to teenage girls, oh yeah, you're going to take a I mean, we, we talked about both this. both infantilization as well as over-sexualization, which is even worse. Yeah, exactly. Oh, the infantilization is... Is, is even more the issue, in my opinion. Well, I mean, it's they're both huge issues, but specifically around this one, because uh, we, we talked about this earlier. We we're talking about Nickelback mm-hmm. and how people hate on Nickelback a lot. Why do they hate on Nickelback? It's not that they're bad songs. It's because... I mean, it's, they're no worse than any other pop song. Right? right. It's probably because most of those fans are women. Why do people hate on Twilight? Probably because most of those fans are women, and especially younger women. Anything that a younger woman likes or is passionate about you're almost immediately going to see a lot of people coming out of the woodwork and saying oh well this sucks and the only thing that they can really point to is the fans oh yeah I or they'll be like, oh, like it's that. just stupid or whatever. Or it was really yeah. juvenile. But like, let me just be clear. Like, so are the Transformer movies, but you didn't get as much shit on that as you did for Jupiter Ascending. Right. A lot of the manga magazines are specifically geared towards younger girls and a lot of chain bookstores I don't know if you remember this, but I have a very vivid memory of back in the day going to, I want to say it was a Walden Books, where they would limit the number of manga that you could buy at any given time as if it were all porn, as if, like, it was somehow damaging to young women. No! I know. That's so stupid. I agree. I've taken genuine stacks of, and this is when I had, like, a gift card for a hundred bucks. I've taken genuine stacks of sci-fi. Yeah fantasy novels up like actual or romance stacks. novels maybe mm-hmm. anything but no manga no manga manga was the problem it's it's so upsetting and it's really difficult to talk about these things in american culture without addressing that because it is such a, a large portion of the the public perception of manga i mean before i ever knew anything about manga that was my perception of it as well because it's such a it's so ingrained it's pervasive. in mm-hmm. it, pervasive is such a good word yes it's pervasive at this point like it's it's so much more mainstream, but it's also part of its appeal is that it's niche. So it's going to continue to be marketed as niche for better or worse for probably a while, which is unfortunate because it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a divisive thing. And it's not for the most part. The worst elements of anything 
are being kind of condensed and then broadcasted loudly, largely through virtual forums. So unfortunately, that's kind of where you're at as far as some of the some of the stuff that you hear. You can't base everything that you think about a media or a phenomena in culture off of the loudest voices on the internet. The problem is I think that it just takes so much longer for cultural perceptions to shift because the people that are just kind of chill yeah. and sensible aren't shouting from the top of their lungs about them being chill and sensible and they're like oh hey manga's pretty cool guys it's just different stories and you come get some cool art like mm-hmm. they're just gonna go about their business and so it takes a lot longer for the cultural perception to kind of permeate with those updates and so i think that the marketing and then again the trolls and stuff online are just going to continue to do what they do trolls gonna troll mm-hmm. i think the other thing that people know most about manga if they don't know anything else about it, is that they are so much smaller. It's very tiny. specific. Like, and I think that was the other interesting thing as as far as like to get people's attention. They're, mm-hmm. they're that they didn't look larger than mass paperbacks, right? But they don't look like a comic book. It uh-huh. looks like something totally different. Yeah. I thought that was really really interesting. So uh, for again, for those of you who maybe don't quite know what we're talking about, so your average manga book is about is about uh, five by seven and a half, which is significantly smaller than your average comic book and also a different size than your average paperback it's holdable in your hands you don't need to use both hands you can just walk and read i Mm -hmm. thought that was really interesting so this article i couldn't i didn't find a ton of other discourse about this but uh, that is actually not how it's sold in japan that's that's an american thing that's not entirely authentic but that size helps keep it cheap in north america that's interesting yeah i um, I know that they do like especially for cereals they'll have like weekly or bi-weekly Floppies, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it, the books are different as well. I didn't mm-hmm. know that. And I think that that adds a level of distinction to it. I don't know if you remember this, but there in, in the early days around this like 2009, 2010 period of manga's popularity, we saw a lot of titles in just regular mainstream comic books usually geared towards teenagers but sometimes not also being sold in that five by seven and a half format i don't know if you read the runaways as it was coming oh, yeah, out yeah, I did. but yeah. it was it in was that in smaller manga. format it was, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good point point. and i mean obviously the the story wasn't really manga but it was that size because they wanted to kind of appeal to that mm-hmm. to that market and that that had a huge influence on i would say the the teen market in yeah. in that era but that was the first i would say comic book that i read that was in that format and that actually it's so probably not what marvel meant but it did get me more into manga that's pretty funny <laughs> I'm just that's so weird like what a like how do you have money like they've got a decent amount of money like you can do like a little market research the top top 20 best selling novels were like what yeah. are the genres or whatever and i thought it was That's really so weird yeah and my my thought is like if they did that research and they're like oh well a lot of the protagonists are teenagers so it's supposed to be geared toward teens it's like a lot of your protagonists are teenagers too so i don't know I'm like what are you trying to say <laughs> it's always so strange to me when people like make these generalizations and then like don't like take those two extra steps to be like and what am i doing <laughs> you know no, self-reflection is the worst kind of reflection. It's very <laughs> difficult to do. It's hard. It's hard to do. This is a, the same reference. Um, uh, the manga field has grown 350% that's, from 2002 absurd. to 2007. And uh, a lot of that is laid at the feet of Tokyo Pop and Fizz Media because originally they did try to go for all of their books to make them the left to right and uh, translate everything but then they stumbled a lot like trying to figure out the best way to get apparently it's obnoxiously difficult I would have thought that it would have been really easy to do I was just like yeah just flip it and change the things but no you lose a lot of cultural stuff or even like yeah like in Inuyasha Mm -hmm. you know you've got a lot of stuff that's based on like uh, Moroku having the void in his hand and just the way that the art works it, it doesn't maybe i mean if you ever do draw when you flip like if you do you do your test by flipping yeah yeah right? you flip it and, and mm-hmm. zoom out mm-hmm. so especially for it stuff, does look different you're absolutely right that's a good that's a good example and for stuff when you're doing your weeklies or your bi-weeklies where you're having to just put a mount of, massive amount of content together very quickly you're not mm-hmm. going to have time to really focus on the quality and making sure that everything's appropriate in every single yeah. And it is a yeah. ton of content. I mean, mm-hmm. 20 years. <laughs> yeah, God, so much. Could you imagine? Luckily, they didn't do Like, luckily, they gave up on that idea. But, I mean, yeah, if God. it had really taken 20 years to get uh, Dragon Ball out, could you imagine? No. I mean, I think <laughs> it would have horrible. died. Like, it would've, we would have had some diehard fans. But, like, for the most yeah. part, it to, to be clear, they did not do that. It, Dragon Ball was released in, <laughs> in volumes like a normal manga. Yes. Like, <laughs> not in floppies. <laughs> 
That's so funny. <laughs> Thank goodness. To be fair, I mean, and that, to be fair, the fact that it was so immensely popular and so long, probably we probably owe it a debt of gratitude for convincing the publishers that the real money lay elsewhere. Yeah, and I, I don't think that it's necessarily a coincidence that after, you know, the manga companies rose and were solidified and found that releasing, you know, issues slash floppies was not a good business decision that comic books kind of start to do the same thing. I mean, these Mm -hmm. days I only buy trades. I don't know about you. I I feel like (laughs) I always say I'm too old for floppies. I mean, keep in mind, I don't know how much space was previously dedicated to advertising. In your floppies nowadays, there's like... It's a lot of advertising. A quarter. It's weird. Minimum of the book is just advertising. Yeah. And sometimes they'll add like stuff that they that's not necessarily advertising, but is still not the story. And it's sometimes fun stuff. I loved some of the stuff. Yeah, Squirrel well, Girl. they'll go. They did like fan mail. Well, yeah, that, stuff and then like they'll that, have but... like uh, you know sketches at the back mm-hmm. of your your average trade, or like some some intros yeah. and stuff. Some so they'll keep in. some of the cool stuff. Yeah. And so you, even that makes it into the trade. But like when you're looking at your weekly, monthly issue of a comic, and right. A quarter of it is ads. It's not the story. Like, right. you don't, nobody likes that. Nobody's got no. time for that. So I wanted to circle back to, you're talking about the Japanese culture. We talked about how, like, there is a weird feeling in American culture, fetishizing and fixating on Japanese culture. And I do wonder if that would have happened without manga. Not to the extent that it has, but I don't think it's just manga. But mm-hmm. I do think it's the the very, it's like the aggressive cross-contamination, the kind of idealized nature or imagined perception of, of Japanese culture mm-hmm. that people get. You know, we've talked about before, like Paris syndrome. It's where if like Japanese people go to Paris and it's not the thing that they've imagined that's been built up in media and stuff and they pass out, like it just shocks them it's a shock to their system specific oh i had heard paris syndrome was different i'd always heard it was like just that depressed feeling that you get when you go to paris and it doesn't live up to your expectations the most extreme is that they pass genuinely out. yeah wow they have to go they, they're hospitalized i hadn't, I hadn't yeah. heard that this was like a specifically japanese phenomenon i well it's, just, it's not like i the original like the wider swath um, and when i initially learned about it was for um was that it was in reference to japanese people specifically just because uh-huh. of cultural consumption of media and we share similar amounts of that consumption right so it's not necessarily a unique phenomenon, but we go much harder than many countries, in my opinion. There's such a variety of fictions that we sell in book, kind of set up on a more of a pedestal because it's a combination of novel and art. And then you've got this foreign culture mm-hmm. that you can just project anything you want onto. So like you've got your hyper masculine, like your berserk people, and you've got your hyper feminine, like the people that liked Sailor Moon and people... Right. 100% have the wrong impression almost consistently about the country. And then how does that play out in their experiences with Japanese Americans or Japanese tourists or Japanese people they're just talking to online, you know, like, it's rough. I was watching um, a TED talk uh, recently. I'm going to butcher her name, but it, uh, she, she talked about, she was an author who talked about stereotyping in literature. And mm-hmm. she said, well, the main problem with stereotypes, not that they're wrong, it's that they're incomplete. It's one idea about mm-hmm. a culture and no culture can be encapsulated in one, one idea and nobody's only one note i mean could you imagine if someone tried to import american literature and just imported our top literature which by the way is historical romance if they just <laughs> brought that in and that is some spicy book stuff so if they just got that and we're like wow americans are so obsessed with bodice ripping and missionary sex and specifically victorian era propriety weird culture that no we're people we we contain multitudes yeah. <laughs> we contain multitudes we our, our lives are not encapsulated by our best-selling media our mm-hmm. lives are not encapsulated specifically by historical romance but that's the thing like we we can you know bring in and say oh manga is the the top genre in japan and, and it may genuinely be i don't know i don't know anything about the japanese market we were i just did research on the u.s market but my guess is that it's it's, it's it's just a genre. It's just a genre. Of and it has people, a lot yeah. of different types of stories, different people to tell stories they about. Have light novels too, which are essentially just a larger yeah. formatted novels like yeah. that you would read. So I I definitely as I was reading some of this cultural commentary, it, it kind of came back to me that again, if if we were going to judge an entire culture based judge on Judge not lest you be judged. Right. Based on one 
media output, it's it would be very, very silly. We also don't we don't want that particular sword to be double edged fam. And if you listeners have any interesting cultural commentary on manga, Please. specifically yeah. in the US, obviously we we always try to focus on the US because we cannot pretend that we are experts oh, in God, anywhere else. Sure. Like we're not even experts here. <laughs> yeah. But like we got the home we got good. the home team advantage. <laughs> We're not actually good at doing anything, so Guys, we just <laughs> anyway. Again, Ooh. shout out to Casey Berenzia and Tony Johnson Woods for the amazing analysis there. Uh, I don't have an author for that bookseller piece, so shout out to the bookseller magazine in the UK. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know Thank why you, you don't list your authors. You That's jerks. silly choice. <laughs> That seems short-sighted. If you have anything you would like us to cover, or if you have anything you would like to add to this, you can reach out to us on Twitter, on Instagram. You can reach out to our email, theinksyncpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to the Ink Sync Podcast, the publishing podcast for the rest of us. I have been Annie. I'm Kate. See you next time.